All right, Neil, how's it going? Good. I think we uh, we have a risk of having our most possible tangents on this episode. <laughs> yes, this is uh, going to be a wonderfully tangent filled episode, I suspect. Yeah. Which, <laughs> you know, those tend to do those tend to do fairly well. I think when we start with the book and then dive off into other areas, uh, the the episodes seem to do better. So I think it's a good thing. Interesting. Those are. Well, I guess we'll do what do what the users want. Do what the, yeah. the listeners want. Um, so this today is, we're going to be. Oh. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> today we're covering the the almanac of Naval Ravikant by Eric Jorgensen. Right, that's how you say his name. Yeah. I believe so. Jorgensen. Yeah. yeah, I know we always uh, mess up people's last names. I got I got a couple messages about that for uh, for energy and civilization. We have uh, we have a few Czech listeners. Uh, <laughs> oh, so what was me, the right answer? Well, I didn't talk to them, so I don't know exactly how to pronounce it. All, all I know is she told me that uh, she was like, it was funny hearing you guys uh, try to pronounce his name and doing it uh-huh. wrong. <laughs> I think you eventually got it right. But I, yeah, I know, like I think I was saying like, yeah, I think I was saying like Vaclav Smeal or something. And I think that's the one that made her laugh. So well, I'm uh, sure she's going to get yeah. more entertainment out of our continued failure to pronounce yeah. it correctly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so uh, Almanac of Naval Ravikant by Eric Jorgensen. Uh, this is kind of an interesting book because it's a book of uh, Naval's wisdom, but not written by Naval. It's written by right. Eric, who assembled the book from interviews that Naval had done on podcasts um, and for some books. And then also anything Naval had tweeted or done in some of his own podcasts with uh, the, the, the podcast he does is with Nivy, right? From Angel List. I think that's right. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So it's kind of a cool book in that sense, uh, just because it's, you know, it's about this guy's thoughts, but it's not really by this guy and Naval is still alive. It's not like a right. biography. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and it makes me also wonder if uh, a similar type, like there's other types of uh, other people who like tweet or have other types of format on a podcast, whatever, um, that, that put out a lot of wisdom, but it's not all in one place. And I find Twitter is really good for a lot of things. Of course, it's free, but Eric did a like a really nice service by kind of aggregating all of this right into one place. Yeah. Um, well, this is a perfect example yeah. of aggregation and uh, aggregation and oh, what's the other term for this? Curation as a service, mm-hmm. right? Where yep. Yep. sure you could go out and you could find everything that Eric reviewed and create your own worldview of what Naval thinks, but he did such a great job organizing, distilling. Uh, collecting the information and then batching it into certain themes and bringing right. it together that uh, it, it turned into something really special and really neat. And I think he did a phenomenal job with it. I, you know, to be honest, I was actually really skeptical about this book going into <laughs> Me too, it actually. Me because too. Because I was like, how good can a book be where it's just like somebody writing about stuff somebody else has like tweeted and said on interviews, right? And it's like, and I already know a lot of Naval's stuff just from listening to him on interviews and things. I was like, how good can this actually be? And I was really impressed it's really good <laughs> like yeah, yeah. eric yeah, actually no, he did it, a great it job provides a it. lot of value it, it, it's so much better organized than what you get by just listening to naval on joe rogan or uh shane Parrish or any of those interviews um exactly really and i think those are those, uh, and that's not to mean like don't go listen to those interviews i think they're all very good uh but this this definitely aggregates them and, and curates them i think is probably the better word into those unified themes and like bring stuff that he said in different places together. And I, yeah, to me, it was really valuable. I mean, I've listened to those interviews as well. And um, I was also skeptical. I think I, I recommended this book that we cover this book after um, I started seeing some other people talk about the book. Right. And I was yeah. like, Hmm, these people aren't people who, you know, just uh, promote like whatever the hot book is of the moment. Right. Like, they, they tend to have pretty good recommendations. And then I was like, okay, maybe I'll check this out. And then I, I mean, I got it and then I skimmed it a little bit and I was like, this actually looks really good. So yeah. that's how we decided to to do this. And here we are. So this yeah. is also kind of a funny one because there's, there's not really like a core idea here. No. Right. I think you know uh, most of the books that we do, oh, you, you disagree? Well, I mean, it's it, the core idea is, I guess, just how he, views the world and lives, lives his life essentially. Right. 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 I, I was going to say, a, it's, there's not like, it's not about scale or about like energy. Yeah. There's not like one core topic that he's talking about. It's almost it's closer like, to a book of aphorisms. Yes. Yep. Yeah. 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 A very good one. So 
It's cool. And I guess we should explain a little bit about who Naval is for anyone who doesn't yes, know. That's a good point. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah. So I guess backstory, Naval's probably most known for being the founder of AngelList uh, or Angel.co, which is like the biggest database of startup information, startup hiring, um, startup fundraising. And then, uh, and now is like a purveyor of venture capital through like a lot of special funds that people on AngelList can do. They also own Product Hunt, which is like a pretty popular place to launch products to get initial customers. And then he's sort of a famous uh, investor himself. So he's invested in tons of like companies at pretty early stages that have gone on to. Yeah, I think Twitter, yeah, uh, Twitter, Uber. Uber. And then there were a bunch of others. I forget the rest no, of that like, list. Brief, but it was a brief big tangent. List. Brief tangent here, but you hear so many people who list themselves as angel investors in Uber that <laughs> that's true. I kind of don't trust it anymore. Or like yeah. it because so here's something that I've I know some people do, which is they list themselves as early investors in like Twitter, but what they really did is they bought employee options on the secondary market. Oh so, interesting. That's clever. Yeah, it's really clever. And you know, if I could do that with a lot of companies today, I would. But I wouldn't call myself an investor in that company. Right. Yeah. Like yep. I mean, I, this, I guess it's almost like buying public stock in a company. <laughs> yeah, like buying public right. stock and then saying, like, oh, you know, I'm an investor in Twitter. It's like, well, yeah, anybody could be an investor in Twitter. You just like go buy yeah. the fucking stock. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so, I guess you could get credit for like the price. Like if you bought Shopify when it first went public to now, like, yeah. okay, you did very, very well. And and sure, you definitely deserve some credit. You're still not an angel investor in Shopify. <laughs> right. Uh, right. For buying when it went public yeah but i know i know exactly what you mean i think it's a and there's like a subtle uh term change that people use too right early investor versus uh angel investor because angel, angel investor yeah. implies something very specific very specific yeah yeah early investor is just relative to where they are right now right like if you invested yeah. in the facebook well, bought, ipo you're probably an early investor <laughs> i bought some facebook stock last week i'm an early investor in facebook yeah, okay. earlier than today i guess yeah. <laughs> yeah i'm an early investor in peloton i bought it ipo does that make me an investing genius I don't know. you'll notice really? like, you'll notice like new funds um there's another like that's one tactic what we what you just described and then this other tactic that i've seen uh quite a bit as well is um let's say like, you know, a company is doing like a, a series C or series D and they're already like a very well-regarded startup. Mm -hmm. A new fund will try to get some investment in that, even if it's a very small amount of money, it might be a 10, 20, $50 million round and they're putting 50 K or hundred K in. Right. Yeah. Uh, but they do it so that they can put that logo on their website. Right. So like Stripe oh, maybe yeah. is a good example. Right. So then you can put Stripe like, Oh, we're investors in Stripe. It, nobody knows what valuation you put in it. You put Yeah, exactly. In, right. Like, uh, yeah. So there's, there's a lot of games Not just like anything. I mean, every, every oh, industry yeah. has their games. So this is, this is just the angel early stage investing. Alex game. Danko actually has a really good article about this, about social capital in Silicon Valley. It's not about mm where you work or have worked. It's about what you've invested in. Uh, I, I so, see that. Yeah. I yeah that's, why, that. yep. that's why people will try to write like very small checks to get on the cap table for these like growing companies so they can say that they were like early investors in them. Um, you know, partially for social capital and partially for the other like investments it opens up doors to. Um, yeah. You know, it kind of clear, makes sense. I'm a I'm 100% oh, one of those people, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is not like, uh, you know, like I'm very aware that that's something I do too, right? Like, I mean, it kind of makes sense, right? It's like, it's, it's like if everybody in your, in your circle has roughly the equivalent, you know, or same order of magnitude money and level of success, then it's like, okay, how do you differentiate yourself again? Like, how do you win that social game? I feel like in uh, maybe before tech, um, one of the things people did was invest in restaurants, right? Like you don't expect to really make money, but it's cool to be, you know, to be able to say like, Oh, this is my I am like a part owner. I'm in a this part, yeah, exactly. Yep. Yep. That's like another I one. Be that part I owner in a bar and restaurant. I like, I was talking to one friend who had this great idea when COVID started, which would be for restaurants to sell off fractional shares. So uh -huh, like if there was a really good restaurant in your city that you knew would come back, if they could just make it through COVID, you could then, them, essentially. yeah, you could basically like buy a stake in them and it could, either, it could also be sort of like a form of like either convertible note or even just a debt round or something, but some sort of interface to enable that so that you could like invest in the restaurants, you know, are going to like do okay. Yeah. I thought it was a really neat idea. I was like, man, there's a few restaurants in Austin. I would definitely invest in if I had the option, but yeah, I feel like that, 
I wonder, is it too late to do that idea? That sounds like a great idea. No, <laughs> I mean, someone should do like, that. People are still scared yeah. in their homes in most of the yeah. countries. So, hmm. I like that idea. Yeah. There's a company out of Pittsburgh that's doing. Um, it's called Honeycomb Honeycomb Credit. I think is the name okay. of it. Um, it's not exactly what you just described, but it's well, it could theoretically they could probably do what you described. Like they're probably licensed to do what you described already, mm-hmm. but. Um, they go after like they, their ideal clients basically are brands that, and they could be brick and mortar. They could just be digital, uh, but they have like very passionate, strong, like social following. So they recently worked with, uh, Orox brewing, which I don't know if you followed them, but in, um, like they're a gluten-free brewery in, in yeah, Pittsburgh. Gluten-free beer. Yeah. And they were, so they released a batch on like a Thursday and it's gone by Friday. So wow. and they've been doing that for a long time. So they, and they've been profitable. It's like three people, like, you know, it's like a, like they have a nice business. Um, yeah. I think recently they got an interesting, like a few interesting, like distribution uh, opportunities. So they needed to increase their, uh, their capacity essentially. And they did raise like outside capital, like this, this honeycomb credit wasn't their only capital, but the idea was they have all these passionate fans who basically buy their beer, like the day it comes out and then they're sold out. So uh, honeycomb credit allows you to basically raise from those people, but it's not equity. They're basically buying a rev share agreement. There's like some term for it, but it's essentially a rev share agreement for a period of time. Um, and then there's like a max payout. So like, I think for theirs in particular, it was like, if you put in a thousand at most, you get like 2000 back or something, uh, hmm. but it's over 60 months. And um, I mean, it is technically a loan, right? So I think it is like, you know, secured by the brewery and stuff, but, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting model. It's another way to like, I mean, I think most of their clients are uh, not really restaurants, but they're things like breweries. I think I saw some like wineries on there and stuff, uh, but it's an interesting business. It's like, if you have passionate consumers who like really like what you're doing and they want to feel like they own a piece of it or that, you know, they, they're already championing it, but then they want to, uh, have like a financial reason to champion it. Right. Then. Yeah. Yeah. It just kind of gives them some more skin in the game. Makes sense. I love yeah. it. Uh, so should we also talk about Naval, Naval? There's a couple, of, <laughs> a couple other things about him. Um, I think he was fairly early in on crypto, right? I, I yeah. He was, he was that. very early on a crypto. His brother Kamal runs a crypto hedge fund, I think okay. with James Altucher. Oh, wow. I didn't or, no, no, no. You know what it was, dude, this is actually kind of crazy. Um, we're already Remember on when, tangent two, and this is like 10 minutes into the episode. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Remember when James Altucher was doing all of those like disgusting Bitcoin scam ads? Yeah. Yep. Naval's yep. brother was like writing the documents that James was selling. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Wow. Okay. Yeah. They're like that. really, I think they're like really good friends or something. So yeah, those, I think those Kamal ads was, were, were yeah, pretty those, sleazy. I'm pretty sure uh, Altucher like is getting sued for those, isn't he? Oh, wow. Did I make that up? Don't. That was like three years ago, right? Like, yeah, wasn't that long ago. Yeah, let's look this up quickly. I think we're hey. like we're we're like two thousand dollars in the Bitcoin price away from seeing that type of stuff again. I think. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like I think if we get to above fifteen, it's going to be uh, it, the the sleaze balls will come back out. Oh yeah, it's it's coming back. Okay, I can't find anything to back up James Altucher getting sued for those ads, but <laughs> he definitely should be. Uh, and I will stand by that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't even remember the content of them. I just remember them being, I remember seeing a couple of them and being like, that's, that's bad. The, the, yeah, there was just like so much of it. And I, I, think, I think Kamal, Naval's brother, has like a crypto hedge fund. It was really early in on a few cryptos. And I assume Naval was as well, because I know he's talked about it a lot. Right. Um, yeah, the crypto and stuff think- is crazy. I think the other thing that he's, uh, I would say even maybe better known for than the Angelus stuff is being like, and this is meant as a compliment. So of all, if you're listening to this, this is not an insult at all. Uh, like a Twitter philosopher, right? Yeah, like definitely. I, I, I feel yeah, like that's I, his, his most that's recent his main, reincarnation. That's his exactly. main thing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I think there's a lot of people who maybe if you've recently come across him, like you didn't know who he was a year ago or two years ago, that, that's probably what you know him for. Yeah, is a lot absolutely. of his uh, yeah philosophical. And his Twitter is phenomenal, right? Like, oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that you know Naval's great gift is distilling ancient, timeless wisdom into very, very, very small packages. He can just condense a lot of knowledge into kind of like self-evident 
statements and like aphorisms, you know, for lack of a better term, yeah. that I think resonate with a lot of people and touch on so many different areas of life um, that he, he does have this really interesting kind of like philosopher technologist position that I can't really think of anybody else who holds a similar. He's slot. almost, he's almost like the modern day Seneca <laughs> in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, Seneca was like disgustingly rich. He yeah. was, <laughs> Seneca was worth something like over a billion dollars in today's money. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like why I always think his, his letters are so funny. Right. Where yeah. it's like, <laughs> In some ways, when I read them, I'm thinking like, this is probably just the shit that you wrote so that your slaves didn't kill you. Like, <laughs> like, oh, you should be happy with nothing because when you have a lot of money, like you're still not going to be happy. And he's like laughing while he's writing it. Like, yeah, fuck see, there's guys. like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's like two ways to look at it. There's like, yeah, that is definitely a possible uh, way to look at it. The other possible way is that um, I, I, at least from what my impression is of like, of that era um, people who had the means were just like, you know, basically, you know, like they had concubines and like, you know, just yeah. like, but just having like a ball then like a hundred percent of the time. And there were certain things where, you know, he would like fast and like do, you know, deprive himself essentially. Um, and you get that sense a little bit from Naval as well, right? Like he yeah. obviously could be, uh, living a lot more fancy life than, than he does. Um, and it seems like he does follow that deprivation thing. But again, it's like with Seneca, it was so long ago, nobody knows. And I wonder, you know, in a thousand years, if someone's reading Naval's stuff, if they would think the exact same thing. They'd be oh, like, oh, yeah. he, was, he was one of the richest people in the, in the world at that time. He was probably just writing this so uh, Antifa didn't kill him or something. <laughs> well, okay. So there's actually a quotation in the book that we can dive into now that is relevant to this that I really like okay. because... <clears throat> And I think Eric structured the book this way, partially because of this quotation, because Naval has this great line in here where he says, uh, let's get you rich first. I'm very practical about it because, you know, Buddha was a prince. He started off really rich. Then he got to go off in the woods. And I think that's like, that is a really honest take on like how to be happy. Uh, Because I I, I do... What I was going to say is like, I don't, you know, I saw a great graph the other day. Maybe we can find it, but it's like, you know, that idea that, oh, above $70,000, like happiness, you know, tapers off and it doesn't change much. Mm, Um, I saw a really good reimagining of that, which is like, well, that graph usually only shows like 10 K per year up to 150 K. And then there's a very small increase from 80 K to 150 K. But then if you redraw the graph so that it's like, 10k 100k a million 10 million 100 million right it keeps going up because just like the significant increase in resources right like every 10x in net worth you're going to have like a probably happier easier life than having one tenth of that and that's like and it's not even like more resources it's also i mean this is maybe just my imagination because i'm certainly not there yet but this um this idea of being like rich forever, right? You've hit like escape velocity. Like if you have a hundred million dollars, I don't, I mean, people have lost that, right? Like you can make really stupid moves, but if you are just not, if you just are not like into risk after you have a hundred million dollars, you'll probably be rich for the rest of your life. Like you just never have to worry about money ever again. And that's, yeah, to your point, that's very different than 150 K. Yeah. (laughs) Like, well, and I think that there's, yeah, it's not the same thing. Yeah. And, a lot of, and Naval has a great quotation here about this too. Um, he's actually going to say it better than what I was about to say. Um, where, it, And this is towards the end of the book, but he says, uh, my old definition was freedom to, like freedom to do anything I want, freedom to do whatever I feel like, whenever I feel like. Now the freedom I'm looking for is internal freedom. It's freedom from. Freedom from reaction, freedom from feeling angry, freedom from feeling sad, freedom from being forced to do things. I'm looking for freedom from internally and externally, whereas before I was looking for freedom to. I think that actually frames the the mm, happiness like increase it. with increased wealth really well because you, you there's definitely hedonic adaptation to things, but I don't believe that there's hedonic adaptation to not having to do stuff you don't want to do. Mm, right. So yeah, if you like if you never have to 
do laundry or clean your house again, right? Like that is probably a sustained improvement in your weekly life. If you never have to wait in line at the airport, cause you can always fly private. That's probably a sustained improvement in your life, right? Like yeah. the, uh, there's this great line in the tower too, from that episode where it's like, you know, more money, new things don't necessarily make you happier, but novelty does. And it's like, there are these emotions and these feelings that are sustainable with greater wealth that make it easier to like be a happier person. Uh, and so I think that Naval's framing or Eric's framing of Naval in this book is really clever because it starts out with wealth, right? It's like, let's get you wealthy first. So you have the freedom to say no to these things that are not making you happy. And then once you have the freedom to do that, then you can more easily build a happy life. And that's really honest too of him because, you know, you do see there are a lot of Twitter philosophers, for lack of a better word, um, out there. And almost all of them are rich, right? And uh, yeah. and it's like, and, and people do, you know, in that sort of Twitter philosopher world, um, there is a lot of, I don't want to call it hatred of wealth, but like dismissal of wealth, right? Um, and, and it's very easy to say that once you have wealth, right? But like, I think Naval's being very honest here uh, when he says that like, you, you let's get you wealthy first. And then- yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, it, it, it's easy to say without skin in the game also, right? Like it's easy to, if you're worth a billion, it's easy to say like, Oh, don't worry too much about money, but you're still keeping your billion. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, you're not, yeah. It's like, if it actually like doesn't make you happy, away. you would have given it away. Right. right. But it kind of reminds me of like how it kind of reminds me of how like entertainers and like, I'm not saying there's not any cost that comes with fame, but it's like the entertainers who like complain about, of fame all the time, but then continue to do stuff to put themselves in the public eye. Yeah. Right. It's like no one's stopping you from doing like what Dave Chappelle did and just like, you know, disappearing for 10 years. For 10 years. Yeah. yeah. You could do that. Like most people didn't really talk about Dave Chappelle during those 10 years, but if yeah. you're going to complain about fame and then you're going to, you know, do an interview every day, like, okay, maybe, maybe you should look at your own behavior before uh, complaining about it. I don't know. Oh yeah. Well, there's uh, this other great yeah. quotation in here where Naval says, uh, to me, the real winners are the ones who step out of the game entirely, who don't even play the game, who rise above it. Those are the people who have such internal mental and self-control and self-awareness. They need nothing from anybody else. I think that that speaks to your point just now, right? Like I, I have so much respect for Chappelle because he was just like, you know what? Fuck you guys. Like I'm going to peace out for 10 years and maybe I'll just never do comedy again. Like I've made a good amount of money. I'm just going to spend time with my family. Not going to do shows except for when I'm like, apparently he would occasionally like fly into a random small town, get blasted drunk and do stand up. (laughs) And it was just like this random surprise that would pop up around the country. But other than that, he never did it. Uh, It's like, nobody does that. It's really impressive. Yeah, I think people in general, and and when I say people, I definitely throw myself into this bucket. Are but like in general, it's very hard to say no to money, right? Yeah. Or like, or yeah, money is one thing, but I think fame for for a lot of people also. But but money definitely. So if somebody um, offers you, let's say, a lot of money to do something you're not so happy about doing, almost all of us would say probably you know yes, depending on the amount of money. But if it you know relative to whatever you know net worth or, or monetary level you're at whatever to you means a lot of money. If somebody offered you a lot of money to do something you don't like, it's very likely you will say yes. Um, and I put myself in that, in that boat, but yeah, Chappelle, like, I think he just at one point just was like, all right, this isn't worth it. I'm not having fun. I'm not going to do this anymore. Uh, yeah. and then he, yeah. And he was just done. Uh, that's impressive. Like I, I, there's not too many examples you can think of, of people like that. No, I, and I'm trying to think, I guess Chris Saka recently did this with investing, right? Where he just basically oh, I guess said Tim Ferriss did it too, right? For angel investing, I remember a few years back he had said, "Yeah, like, but I feel like anymore. Tim's doesn't totally count just because he didn't totally step away from everything. He just that's said he's true. not going to he do was, angel yeah, investing. That's true. Chris that's Saka, true. it seems like, is just like living in Tahoe, doing nothing, hmm. um, or like spending time with his family. Let me see. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, that's retiring from venture capital and Shark Tank. We're not going to invest in any more companies." Um, although wasn't there, hold on before I say this out loud, I want to fact check myself. Um, I think he got like me too a little bit. Oh, really? Okay. I must've missed that. Yeah. I didn't see that. 
Uh, I think it's one accusation from filming Shark Tank. So, hmm. Are we just going to get sued by like James Altucher? And- We're going to get sued by so many people for this episode. <laughs> 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 but no, there's, there's stories on this one. I'm like CNBC. Okay, yeah, you're just quoting the story. Yeah, I'm just quoting the story. I didn't do that. Um, but yeah, I think so. Uh, just going back to, to what Naval was saying, like, I think he's very honest about the need to, well, maybe not the need, but like, it's better to start, you know, to get wealthy first and then kind of think about the other stuff. I think he's also, in my opinion, very honest about the person he used to be, right? Like he writes a lot of, or I guess he doesn't write a lot. Eric writes a lot about that, um, yeah. in different interviews where Naval is talking about how earlier in his career, um, he was very anxious. He was very, uh, kind of like quick to getting angry. I think he mentioned at one point. Um, and, and it seems like it's really been, I think he even explicitly mentions this, like the, almost like the mission of the past decade or so of his life to control that and to kind yeah. of get, get that part of his brain basically under control. Yeah. Which makes sense. You know, it's like, especially if you're in, that kind of role, like being an investor, the amount of inbound that you must be an investor at that level, the amount of inbound you must get and the amount of just like random shit you have to sift through. And obviously you're going to have a team that helps filter stuff. Um, but you can't like, you can't assume that they're going to be like doing everything perfectly. So you're going to have like some stuff that you've got to go through anyway. And like just going through all that information constantly and, that sense of, Oh, if I don't jump on everything immediately, I'll probably miss out on good opportunities. Like that's tough. <laughs> like yeah. that, There's no you, way think, that can be easy psychologically. Definitely not. I mean, I think the, the one big thing, well, I know. Cause like, I, I definitely have this problem myself. Like I have a very hard time saying no to money. Um, but one filter I've used, and I feel like you probably use a similar filter, but let me, uh, I'll say, I'll say it. And then I'll ask you if you do the same thing. Um, I was finding myself working with people that I didn't necessarily enjoy working with just yeah. because they were, it was leading to good contracts and stuff. And, um, yeah. And so like, I just made, you know, a decision, maybe it was more than a year ago now, but just, I'm not going to work with people I don't enjoy working with or like that are annoying. Let's put it the other way. It's like the negative, right? It's like, I'm not going to work with people who are like a drain on my energy essentially. Right. Uh, I think that's yeah. super important. Yeah. Right. Just being like, Oh yeah. If you know, I'm just, if I have even the slightest inkling that this person is going to become like a terrible person to work with like or that I don't trust them. Yeah, yeah. A client from hell. It's like, I've learned that lesson a few too many times. Like I've learned it a couple times more than I should have. <laughs> right? We all have. We all have. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think I've gotten good enough at it now to filter it out, but like some people still slip through obviously, but yeah. And it's, like, it, it's, it's easy to like get caught up in like the allure of like, Oh, that's going to be a good contract. But it's like, okay, is that contract, worth like one your mental piece but then also it's going to bleed into all the other stuff you're doing because when you're when you do have that piece or like that um balance i guess you just you're just so much more effective and less stressed and i don't i don't even know that like all the adjectives to describe it it's just you're just on you're just firing on all cylinders when you when you're kind of in that right mental state and nothing takes you out of that mental state faster than a client from hell Oh just, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I mean that's actually I was having this conversation with um with a deal actually earlier today. Oh yeah, he says hi. He was over here co-working earlier. Hey. But <laughs> one of one of the things that I've like really just come to appreciate from like living in Austin and from you know running my own company and doing all that is this kind of freedom from anyone I don't want to spend time with. Right? Like makes sense. This, is, this is kind of it's the same track as the freedom from like clients you don't want to work for, but also just people you don't want to work with in general. It's like money is such a useful, like wealth allows you to say no to people who are kind of like toxic in your life. That is a really good point. That is a really good point. Yep. It's like I have, I have one like business relationship to use a sufficiently obscure description of it where (laughs) it's like, I basically have no like contractual way out of it for the time being. And it's going to cost like, like $60,000 total, but I would rather just like 
lose that money over the period that I'm going to lose it and not have to think about like that person or the problem at all, then try to save like half of it by putting a bunch of mental energy and resources into like fighting, negotiating lawyers, whatever. Right. Like at some point, if you have the freedom to just like spend money to free your mental energy, it's so worth worth it. it. Do that. It's worth it. Yeah. Like last year or no, that was, it was earlier this year. It was early 2020, like January. Uh, My dad was in the hospital and there was a contract I was working on that was with like, I had a bunch of contracts going on, but this one in particular was with a, particularly annoying client. I'll put it that way. Um, and they had paid me 20, it was like one very specific ask and they paid me 25% of the contract value up front. 75% was going to be, uh, on the deliverable. And I was mostly done with it. I mean, Mm -hmm. not mostly, I probably still had like 15 hours or so to still work with it. And, And that would include like probably five hours of calls with them. And I was just like, after a few days of trying to balance that, I was just like, you know what, this is not worth it. So I just told them like, I can't, I like, I mean, I used the excuse basically. My dad was in the hospital, but I said, I just can't get this done with all the stuff going on, on my personal life. So, uh, you know, I'm happy to return your 25% that you paid up front, but I just can't, uh, can't do it right now. And it's so freeing to have the, or sorry, it's so, it was such a relief to have like the freedom to do that. Right. Cause like, cause I mean, to Naval's point about wealth actually helping you in a lot of these things, and I wouldn't even classify myself as, as wealthy at all, but I was just at a point, I'm, I was at a point where I didn't need that contract necessarily. Right. So, um, if I needed that contract to like put food on my table, right. That's like, you know, you just have to suck it up and do it. Right. And that's, yeah. and that's where wealth can be really freeing, uh, for a person or money in general can be really freeing for a person. Just cause as you said, I think a few minutes ago, it gives you the freedom to turn down stuff. It gives you the freedom yeah. to not, not do stuff you don't want to do. Uh, well, and sometimes that's beautiful. And I think that sometimes you even need to adopt that attitude before you can totally afford to have it. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. Oh, for, he for, did that, right? He did that. Yeah, he I think he did. How much he, he valued his time. Right? Yeah, he said his he said his aspirational hourly time at a thousand dollars an hour, and then like even if he was losing money by making decisions, he pretended that's what his time was worth, and then eventually it surpassed that. And I think that's actually a really helpful model. I mean, we had the situation at Growth Machine earlier this year when like right when COVID started, we basically lost like half of our clients in the span of two weeks, right? Just because everybody was like, oh, everyone was panicking at that time. Yeah, Yeah, everyone was panicking, canceling contracts, things like that. And so we were like very unprofitable in terms of like projected revenue and whatnot. Um, And so I told everyone, I was like, look, we need to figure out how to save a ton on costs and like restructure and like figure things out so that we can like get through this without having to lay anyone off. And then two weeks later, we had this one client who was still being a huge pain. um, And then I ended up deciding to just fire them. And it was like, we needed that six, seven grand a month, but it was worth it to like pile up the risk a little bit more to give everyone a bit more of the like mental space to focus on doing like an awesome job for the rest of the clients and Mm, not be like bogged down by this one asshole client. Um, and that was like, uh, you know, I, I think that was a good decision, even if it like might've made a CFO, you know, pull out their hair. It's like, <laughs> like it, it's, you have to do that sometimes. So like, I have this other stupid example, which I think is just me justifying my own laziness. But <laughs> if, if I get something from Amazon and it like doesn't work or it's defective or, uh, I realize I don't need it. I, if it's under like a hundred dollars or $150, I tend to end up just throwing it away, which I know is bad, but like, I'm so lazy with that stuff that I don't want to take the time to like, go in report it is not working like get well, it shipped. Said he does that too like, he yeah he that when too. i saw it in the book i felt so <laughs> validated i was like ah i'm not the only one <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah like, no, i know no, i'm no, never gonna get that. around to this so no i think that's that it's a lesson that like i i think it <laughs> and i'm not old for anybody listening i'm, I'm like i'm 29 years yeah, old but i feel like i've learned it i feel like i've learned it uh, very late in life compared to other people. Right. Like, I mean, especially, you know, watching, watching you, watching some other people in my life, I I think you've been very good about automations and like not repeating work and and trying to find, um, you know, whether outsourcing, you know, different tools basically to, uh, avoid essentially doing work that you don't have to do, or that, you know, is maybe below your hourly rate. Um, and I feel like I've only recently started appreciating that over the past couple of years. And, uh, it's awesome, right? Like it, it, it helps a lot. And 
it feels weird at the beginning uh, to anybody listening who's struggled with that in the past. Like, at least for me, it felt weird. It's like, why am I paying somebody to do this? I can do it too. Right. And yeah. like, I can probably do a better job and, Oh, I have to train this person. or I have to tell them what to do. And it's like, what you're doing is you're ideally right. And of course it doesn't always work out this way. You're training somebody one time to do it or, you know, for however long it takes to do it. And then you never have to do that again. So your time yeah. is freed up for higher level tasks or other tasks that maybe other people can't do. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's such an important yeah. mindset. I, I had a whole article on this recently about the systems mindset, which is exactly what you're describing where, yeah. and I, I also call it, I don't remember the exact term I used, but it's sort of like productive laziness Yeah, where yeah. You just get so mind-numbingly bored and annoyed by having to do the same thing more than a couple times that you will like waste a lot of energy and resources up front to significantly reduce the long-term resources that it requires from you. Yeah. And that's like a really useful mentality to have, I think. And I think that a lot of and you know, one of the other points I made in the article is that I think that when you're salaried or when you're purely making your money on a salary, it's very hard to have that mentality. Yeah. Because uh, all of like your, your money is fixed. Like you get a set amount each year and that's what you have to like draw from. Um, but if you have like any ability to make money on your own, then you actually have a reason to free up time because that could actually increase the amount of money you make. Right. Yeah. So that was one of the other yeah, points in the article was like, you, you should have at least something you could do on the side with free time where it makes sense for you to pay someone to like do stuff that, you know, isn't, the most isn't like the best work you could be doing. And it's also like, um, what are, what is someone paying you to do? Right? Like, why do they need, why do they need you? Like, like there's a project I'm working on right now. And I mean, I gave the company the option of just like, okay, basically they were trying to figure out if they're trying to like open up a new vertical basically for themselves. And, um, there was some customer development work basically that needed to be done. I'm, I would say pretty good at doing that. So I, I you know, I, that's something that I would go do myself. Cause you got to kind of figure out where the, I guess, where the actual ability to sell their, their, uh, tool into that market is. And, uh, that's something that I thought I'm pretty good at. Now we got to that point and they were like, Oh, well now can you help us sell into that market? I'm like, I could, uh, is that like, do you need me to do, do that? And so they, yeah. They, they do. I mean, they were saying they still want me to do it. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to take the contract and then uh, <laughs> bring on some other people to, to actually do that work. Cause I know now what the script is going to be. I know like who the players are. I know who they need to contact. I know the job title that, you know, who would be the buyer. So it's like, okay, you can out, you can give me that contract, but I'm going to send, give it to my team now. So yeah. Uh, yeah. But that's the way to do it. Whereas in the past I would be thinking, okay, yeah, I can go do that. And then I would go and do it basically. Right. Like, and that, probably isn't the best use of my time. Right. Um, yeah. So anyway, I mean, there, it's a great mentality. I think the other thing is like the world, and he mentions this in the book. Uh, I don't remember the exact quote, but the world is increasingly becoming uh, like, I guess he used the term infinite, le- like we have infinite leverage because of technology. Yeah. Um, yeah oh, I found the quote. So he says, technology democratizes consumption, but consolidates production. The best person in the world at anything gets to do it for everyone. So yeah. these like automations and outsourcing, um, I mean, these are ways to increase leverage for yourself uh, to be able to essentially service more more clients or more people with what you're doing. So yeah, I mean, the amount of like what you can do with just simple online tools now is so incredible, incredible. to me. It's incredible. It's like, I mean, I've been really seeing this with the Rome course, where like over three thousand students have gone through it now. And like the infrastructure I would need to teach 3,000 students something. That's a college. That's yeah, like a that's, college, man. That's half of Carnegie Mellon. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like... I mean, of course, you're not charging uh, whatever their tuition is now, like 75 yeah, 5,000 a class. Yeah, like, but... Maybe I should. There we go. Maybe you should. <laughs> <laughs> But it's just like that, you know, nobody was able to do something like that 10 years ago. Really. Well, and here's the crazy thing. You've, you've done 3000. Is there anything from an infrastructure perspective, uh, from an infrastructure perspective, preventing you from going to 30,000? No, I would need to hire maybe one more person to help with support. Exactly. And like, so like, that <laughs> that's leverage, right? Like that is scale yeah. and leverage. I mean, there's no better uh, example than that. No. Like and it, you spent the same amount of time making the course, whether one person took it or 30,000 people take it. Yeah. That's the other huge thing, right? It's like, if you're doing, and it's funny cause 
is, or it's like, yeah, if you're doing live stuff, then you're kind of limited in your leverage unless you're like packaging that and reselling it afterwards. But that's also why you can like charge more for live stuff. So this is kind of like the funny contrast between me and Tiago. Cause like Tiago runs the Forte Academy that the Rome course is on. And he does almost exclusively live stuff because you can do it super high ticket and it can be really high touch. And I just like, can't stand doing live stuff. I did one live session for the Rome course, but I'm not sure if I'll ever do one again, just because I hate, I really hate doing anything that I can't like, massively distribute or massively scale like it it literally yep. pains me to do anything that is behind or that is like time limited or in like a small community or whatnot because it feels like such a waste compared to if i did that on a broader scale yeah i think well and i think that speaks to you being very good at realizing time is finite um and i think to me that like for me that was a big switch that went off of like okay why am i not outsourcing this stuff and, and again this goes back to like what Naval says too. Um, once you have that realization, you're like, okay, there's nothing like, yes, money is valuable, but nothing is more valuable than your time. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And then it's like, okay, if I can spend this little bit amount of money, but it frees up my time, that's totally worth it. Cause you can make more, I mean, you can always make more money. I mean, you can't, you can't make more time. I mean, there's no, the only way to make back. more time is like, yeah, you can't exactly. Yeah. So, um, I, mean, I, I think, think you're sooner, very good. Like when right. you were saying you feel like physical discomfort, right? Like that means you very deeply understand that idea. Yeah. I mean, dude, that's why I'm, that's part of why I'm loving this YouTube stuff so much because there, there is a big value in having your own site. And I think it's really important to have your own site and have your own email list and everything. But the, uh, the built in distribution of something like YouTube is pretty incredible, Right. It's like I've been doing yeah, my news. I've been saying that. I've been seeing you doing it. Yeah. Well, and it's like the I've been I've been doing my newsletter for four and a half years, and it'll get like maybe fifty to a hundred new signups a day, um, and then there's unsubs and everything, obviously. So, but then it's like I've been doing YouTube for a month, and I'm getting forty to a hundred new subscribers a day. It's so, <laughs> like wow. how it, it just it's so much faster with like that built-in to distribution. Be fair. To be fair, you have built-in distribution already, right? Like, well, also, yeah, I mean, because from, the, from the newsletter, you did when you exactly, and yeah, when you first yeah. started your newsletter, you didn't have that. So maybe there's some of that also. I, I think there is just this element of like being part of a platform that helps promote you. That right? is like yeah. such a powerful tool for multiplying your efforts, and I think people people under people probably like overestimate what they can do with building a platform in a year. Like it takes a long time to get started and get any recognition, but definitely underestimate where they could get to in like five years with it. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a really good point. And then I, like I had a recent epiphany on the value of having an audience. So like my audience is much, much smaller, but I have my email list is like about a thousand people. And on Twitter, I think it's like 2,200 or something. But I recently launched uh, something called Open Innovation Leads, and it's just a email newsletter. Every two weeks, I um, send out like all these innovation opportunities that companies put out, but they market horribly, um, and they yeah. almost all have pretty decent sized contracts attached to them. Uh, so I've been seeing this like gap there. Anyway, I all I did to launch it was like some tweets, and I put it in my newsletter, and I got very quickly to 200 subscribers. And I'm like, how many months or years did it take me to get to 200? subscribers on my personal email list. Like yeah. it took a lot longer. Right. And it was like within a couple of days, it got to 200. I'm like, there's real value. Cause if you, if, if like you extrapolate that, maybe you can't always do that, but if like, okay, then it makes me wonder, okay, if my personal list was like 10,000 and my Twitter following was 10,000, right. Then it's like, okay, then if I launch something that resonates with that audience, I might have 2000 subscribers on the, on the first day. Right. Which is, yeah. uh, which is, those are like real numbers. So, oh yeah. Uh, yeah, it was it was really interesting. Like, cause I haven't launched anything in you know in a long time, and so that was like the first kind of launch I did, and I didn't really, I wouldn't say really, you know, spend a lot of effort launching it. I posted it on social media and mentioned it once in my newsletter, <laughs> <laughs> and and it got to that like got to two hundred, which you know again is not massive numbers, but it's not nothing either. Yeah. So there's there's really a value to building audience. Well, and he's got this, uh, he's got this great line in here, page 63, where he says, learn to sell, learn to build. If you can do both, you will be unstoppable. Yeah. I, I think I it's like, that also. I love it's it. such a great line to really capture 
how you make money in today's economy. Because like, if you can do one of those two things, if you can build in any capacity or if you can sell in any capacity, that's where you get really significant leverage on your time. Um, Cosette and I were having this I mean, you're convers- 100% of the ahead. time. Oh, go ahead. Go, no, no, go ahead. I was going to say, Cosette and I were having this conversation earlier because, you know, she's, she's a realtor now and she's helping, you know, sell and buy houses and everything. And like the, the effort it takes to sell a $250,000 house is less, but not one tenth of the effort it takes to sell a $2.5 million house, right? Mm-hmm. It takes maybe yeah. 20% more work to sell the more expensive place just because like the buyers are going to be a little slower maybe, and there might not be as many buyers or whatnot, but like it's not 10 X the work. It's maybe like 10, 20% more. And so right. you can make us, uh, you can make significantly more money in the same amount of time by being a better salesperson, right? At the same time, to your point, like if you know how to build stuff and especially build stuff that can continue to grow and make money like while you're asleep, then you really get into crazy amounts of you know passive income for lack of a better term. Right. Well, and I think that's a really good way of putting it. The, that can generate money while you sleep. I think sa- like you can do that with sales and with building, obviously. Uh, yeah. But I think with sales, like you can do it where uh, and maybe realtor is not the best example. Cause I, I mean, I, I'm not a realtor, so I don't know, but I think you get paid lump sum, right? Which yeah. is still fine, but you can invest that in assets that, uh, make money while you sleep. But, um, with sales, you can, I mean, you can structure things different ways. Once you have, I guess, once you've proven that you can sell, right. You have a lot right. of leverage because everybody need, like if somebody came to you Nat, and was like, I can bring you a million dollars worth of more business. Uh, can I get 10% of that? If I bring you a million dollars worth of business, and by the way, you don't have to pay me anything up front, right? Like you'd be like most people, most business owners would be like, why not? Right? Like, yeah. sure. Be like, yeah, uh, of course. Yeah. Right. So it's like, if you can, and if you're confident in your selling ability, you know, you can, as he says, if you know, you can sell, uh, you basically like, you can never be on un- like, you'll never really be unemployed. Yeah. And I, I mean, think it's the same with building, right? If you can, highest... build, yeah. Sure, yeah, go ahead. No, Sorry. saying if you can build or if you can sell. Like you're never, you're never going to have a shortage of work basically. Yeah. Like do both of those. Yeah. Yeah. Or if you what I was going to say is like, unstoppable. <laughs> exactly. The, the highest paid person at growth machine is our head of sales. It's not me. And yeah, I believe it. I'm like more than happy to pay that because it's a, it's an extremely challenging job, right? It's a, well, there's very, a lot of noise in your space too. Like that's the, I mean, you guys don't do uh commodity th- work, but yeah. there's, there's so much crap in the space. That- but I think like, yeah, I mean, sales gets a bad rep just because there are a lot of sleazy salespeople out there. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, I, I've told people in college this before too. It's like, you think you can make a lot of money in consulting and finance? Like if you get into B2B SaaS sales, you could be making a few million dollars a year, like just going to cocktail parties. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> It's crazy how much money you can make if you get really good at that stuff. Um, yeah. And everybody is selling, right? Like that's the other yeah. thing is like people act like they're, they're not selling, but, uh, if you're, I mean, let's say you're just trying to get a job even, right? Like what, what is an interview? <laughs> like, yeah. Other than a sale. It is a sale. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, I mean, it's no, no different. So I think learning to sell regardless of even what field you're in, it's, it's super useful. And I think also he uses a broader definition of sell, uh, which I liked also like marketing right. is, he includes is marketing. Yeah. Which marketing is, think it is because. Yeah. And you know, that's the thing that I, I'm I'm so glad that I like decided to invest in learning early on because it's like I was just thinking about this with like my site and stuff where there were a lot of little things that I just, you know, did along the way that didn't really mean anything at the time, but just continuing to do them for a long period, like they eventually turned into like a very valuable asset. Or like the book notes is a perfect example, right? Where that was just like putting up book notes because I was like, you know, wanting some public accountability for what I was reading. And then eventually that turned into like a huge amount of like search traffic and yeah. the like product associated with that, that makes like a couple grand a month. And it's just like, okay, cool. It's like, I do nothing with that. It just sits there and earns, which is like, right, which is awesome. the, the dream, right. With yeah. a lot of this stuff. And it, it's like Naval captures all of this so well, right. Where, and I think it's like encapsulated in this quotation too, where he says that the year I generated the most wealth for myself was actually the year I worked the least hard and yeah. cared the least about <laughs> the future. That. Right. Cause yeah. there, there's something to that where if you like give yourself some space, step back, 
think and then put like a ton of energy into something for a short period of time, you can get like a crazy outsized return from that. Like the whole Rome course I recorded in a week, right? Yeah, I believe that. And just put it up. And I'm sure you've had that experience too, where you just like work really hard on a problem for a week or two and then it pays dividends for months or years. Right. Yep. Yep. That's it. I mean, that's a great way to think. It's also, there's also something to, uh, I think there's like a section, I think that's the same one you're referring to where he was talking about, he's, he was telling people he's retired, right? Yeah. There's really something to that too, because like when you tell people you're, you know, in his case, retired, or if you're not doing something like you find out people, let's say people really do want to work with you, like the, the amount they might be willing to pay, might be a lot higher yeah. uh, than you expected. And also there might be something mentally to being, uh, maybe going back to like the game analogy, right? Like being that far out of the game uh, right. that you just, you don't get emotional about it maybe. Right. So you can see things for what they are uh, when you're not in that sort of like day-to-day rat race essentially. Yeah. Uh, so there's something there. Yeah, there's definitely something to this, like work really hard and then take a step back for a while uh, and then look at it. But that's, that's really only doable if you're building uh, something that ha- that can earn while you sleep essentially. Right. And, you can't do that if you're selling your time. Like you can't, well, I mean you could, but you just need to, then you'll be burning savings. Like you could, yeah, if you're making money by the hour, then you, you would be not working and you wouldn't be making money (laughs) during those hours. So uh, I I like, I like how much he narrows it down here where he's basically like the only really high leverage products are code and media. It's like it, it almost sounds too, simple to be true but i really can't think of something else that is as uh effortlessly scalable as code and media right they're they're basically infinitely scalable like this podcast we're recording we're recording right now but somebody in five years might listen to it right right? and like well and it it doesn't doesn't take any any additional work yeah for us for this podcast to be listened to by a hundred people or a hundred thousand right Whereas like if growth machine went from 50 to 500 clients overnight, like we'd have a fucking problem. (laughs) You can't just like magically service 10 times as many people in one day. Right. Uh, But if this podcast 10 X overnight, I mean, literally nothing would change on the production end. Like, yeah. Yep. Or on the money end. Cause we don't make any money off this. Yeah. I was going (laughs) to, we're not capturing any of that upside. So we should think about it, but we could get the, we could get some sponsors. That's what we would do if we sold yeah. on 10x. <laughs> yeah, although there is something nice and freeing to not having sponsors, also. So I, mean, I, maybe dude, I go right. back and forth on that so much, right? <laughs> with like ads in general, it's like I, I do some ads for the medley, but it's a terrible ad business because I say no to like ninety five percent of the people who reach out. I'm like, eh, I don't like your product enough. Like, eh, I don't use this. Like, I'm never yep. gonna get around to trying this. Like, eh, I've got coffee I like better than yours. Like. So it's, it's a very it limited, like hard. yeah, yeah, it exactly. becomes tough. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know about you. I don't like when a podcast has an ad, I just skip it. So yeah, I, skip it. I also I mean, feel I, bad I think it's we, like sold ads and then like the advertiser, like I know I wouldn't listen to the ad, right? Like as soon right, as I right. started talking about the ad would, or starting about talking about the product, I would just skip because I mean, can't. this is, this is kind of a tangent, but if you have any kind of audience, building your own products is so much more profitable than running Agreed. ads. hundred like percent. The the amount of money my site makes from products versus what it would make if I had ads on it is like probably 10x. Oh it's, yeah. It's not even close. So I think that a lot of people just default to advertising as like the model. Well, it's easy. It, it is you know, easy. It's like, yeah, it's like you can turn it on tomorrow and... Uh, like, I mean, I think there's podcast ad networks, right? Like we could just join one and tomorrow we'd have, you know, some money coming in, but it's yeah. it also like, in my opinion, dilutes the quality of the product. It also, um, is just annoying for the listener. Right. So dude, we should make uh we should make swag. I, I was just going to ask the, I was going to say to the audience, like if you guys have product ideas or anything, you, uh, can any we, ideas, hit us up. Can we get some custom made uh yetis that say tangent fuel on them oh, like yeti coffee I like mugs <laughs> right like <laughs> i like it we should do that 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 works i, I think that would be fun we could do we could get like a hundred of them and just see if anybody buys them yeah i we think do, we could do that that would be and it's not those are not hard to do those types of products no no and, and, and yeti has like good bulk discounts so it wouldn't cost much more than a normal yeti and i feel like it'd be kind of a fun Ooh, little thing i like, I like it. that idea we, we do custom yetis for the growth machine team that's why i thought of it it's like a nice we gift. should do this we should yeah. do this. 
And we can do like right, okay. Here's too. here's what we'll do. Here's what we'll do. <laughs> if you're listening to this and you would buy some kind of made you think themed Yeti or another product, please tweet at us and we will look into getting it. If we get ten tweets or more, we will do it. All right. Other than that, we will not. How does that sound? I'm in. All right. So at Nav- Nav- this- and at the real Neil S. Yep. And on this exact point, by the way, back to the book, I found a quote that's like. He just puts it so perfectly. I don't even know how his brain does this. He has forget rich versus poor, white collar versus blue. It's now leveraged versus unleveraged. That's so true. Like what, how you can't put that any better. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I like, I I think that, I mean, there's so much to that, right? Like there's so many things you can unpack in there because I was having this conversation, I think with a deal. um, And he was saying that like he, he was playing poker with some hedge fund guys in New York city and one of them like rolled in and had just gotten a million and a half dollar bonus check. Holy shit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but the dude has to work like, you know, hundred hour weeks is always on call. Seemed like yeah. strung out on, you know, caffeine or Coke or something, right? Just like not a good life. And if he got fired, he would make zero dollars tomorrow. Right. right? Like right. hopefully he has some of that fat bonus saved up, but it's like, you know, I wouldn't trade my career for his like i would rather yeah yeah, i would rather have like leverage and you know something that earns while you sleep than have like insane paychecks but be completely beholden to like an awful schedule right and also just like the freedom right like there's i i had this conversation uh with someone when i was uh this is like before everybody was working remotely right so this is like maybe 2016, 2015, like a lot of corporates did not do remote. I was, so I had a a contract at the time with Estee Lauder. I was, I was most taking up most of my time. Uh, and and they were paying, you know, very well, but I got to be remote most of the time. I mean, I traveled for, for them quite a bit, but, uh, when I wasn't traveling, I was remote and, uh, somebody asked me, uh, who worked there also, but somebody asked me, they were like, well, if they made you an offer, but you have to come into the office, like how much more would they have to pay you? And I like thought about oh, yeah. it and I was like, it would have to be like four or five times what I was getting yeah, paid. Now, there was no lot. way that was going to happen. Right? <laughs> there was no way they were going to be paying me like, you know, close to a million dollars a year. <laughs> so I was just like, no, that's not, I, mean, I know they're not going to do that, but like, that's what it would be for me, you know, cause like there's so much more freedom when you're, when you're remote. Uh, um, yeah. you know, you can like, I was going to the gym at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, right? Or like one o'clock in the afternoon because I just tend to work out better at that time. And I could do that. I didn't have to go at seven o'clock in the morning because I have to go to the office <laughs> yep. like or go after go, you know, being at the office all day. Uh, and then no commuting. Like I've commuted once in my career. Terrible. Uh, <laughs> do not, did not enjoy it. Uh, I don't know if you've ever had the misfortune of that, but I feel really bad for people who have to commute because when, when I worked on my one bad. real job, I had to commute from my apartment to the office, which was a five minute skateboard ride. So, oh, okay. That's not, a that commute. was manageable. That's not a commute. <laughs> Don't cry. No, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> mine was, uh, mine was in the Bay area. And part of it was driving from San Bruno where I lived into, uh, Palo Alto, which is the direction everybody goes. So it was like a 20 mile drive that took more than an hour usually each way. Uh, and it was just traffic. Right. And it's like, yeah, it's terrible. And then we moved offices, uh, from Palo Alto to, uh, where was it? Walnut Creek. Um, so in East Bay, so I, I could take, I could take BART instead of driving, but that was like an hour in BART. Right. So it was like, it's still an hour <laughs> each way. And it was just crap. Like, you know, I read a lot during the BART rides because you could right driving. You couldn't really do that, but it's still not like you, I would rather be reading in my apartment, right. Or like <laughs> reading somewhere more pleasant than on a BART Seriously. train. So, uh, um, well, I think yeah. it like, I don't, I don't recommend is... commuting if you have the choice. No, there's another quotation from the book that I love. I think this is one of my favorite ideas that I, I'm pretty sure I originally got from Naval because I've said this to so many other people since hearing it, where he says, uh, one day I realized with all these people I was jealous of, I couldn't just choose little aspects of their life. I couldn't say, I want his body. I want her money. I want his personality. You have to be that person. Do you want to actually be that person with all of their reactions, their desires, their family, their happiness level, their outlook on life, their self-image? If you're not willing to do a wholesale 24-7, 100% swap with who that person is, then there is no point in being jealous. It's such a useful like mental model to have. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. And also for most people, I mean, for everybody, like you only see the surface, right? Like you don't see their demons. You don't see like all the bad, you know, all, I mean, people, especially if you just know somebody through social media, right. It's not a good way to, to be like, Oh, that person's life is so great. Right. Cause you just, you never know what's going on under the hood or behind the scenes. So yeah, it's, it's a really good model. And it's, well, I've seen that as well. And I've, I've mentioned it to people and part of me is like hesitant to mention that to people. Cause I'm like, Oh, then they're just going to compare themselves to what they see on other people's social media. Um, but yeah, I think I totally agree with the the statement. Yeah. There was a I mean, couple other things. so helpful because like, I'm sure but, you have this experience yeah. too, where you're like jealous of somebody for something. Yes. But then whenever yeah. I feel that I like think about this quotation and this idea and it immediately kind of like gets rid of that because I can always find other areas where I feel like, you know, where things that I love about my life that I would lose if I completely swapped with them. And then it's like, oh, I'm actually not jealous of them. Right. Like I want the small part, but I can't have just like a small part and not get the rest of it. Um, Yeah. That's not how it works. (laughs) No, no. (laughs) You you can't swap anyway. You can't swap anyway, but yeah, yeah, you can't just pick it. Even if you could. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, There was one really interesting quotation near that same section, but I think it was a little further. Oh, I found it. Uh, Okay. So he's talking about contrarians. So he says, a contrarian isn't one who always objects. That's a conformist of a different sort. A contrarian reasons independently from the ground up and resists pressure to conform. Cynicism is easy. Mimicry is easy. Optimistic contrarians are the rarest breed. I, I really like that. because I, I think, like that idea. Um, yeah. I, I'm sure you've noticed this as well. Like there are, and I sometimes fall into this trap myself. So this is also a comment directed at myself. (laughs) Um, but it like, sometimes I see like something popular or something getting trendy and I like immediately like rebel against it or like immediately think that's stupid. Right. And I'm like, wait a minute, am I just being contrarian for the sake of being contrarian? Like, I don't even know what that thing is. Right. (laughs) Right? Um, and I, yeah, I haven't even given it a look and I'm already saying like, I don't like it. Yeah. Isn't that, that's like a pretty stupid way to think. Right. That's yeah. also being a conformist. It's the same thing Just as a being conformist a conformist of a different, the other way. Exactly. Yeah. yeah I, I like how he frames it that way. Right. It's like, you're not yeah. actually, it, it's kind of like, uh, it's sort of like the always funny critique of, uh, I don't know if it's goths or it's like, it's one of those groups where it's like, I'm going to rebel against society and conformity by dressing exactly the same and behaving the same as this other group. <laughs> right. <That's> like true. <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> It's like some of the some of the like red pilly crowd, right? Like, you know, in celly guys who feel like super woke because they like actually understand the world. And it's like, no, 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 you traded one orthodoxy for another, right? Actually, yeah. the better example here is like strong atheists, right? Exactly. A lot like, of strong atheists used to be very religious. Yeah, and they're just equally yeah. religious about atheism. Like any, yep. anybody who talks about being atheist for the most part is as religious as a religious person. They're just religious yeah. about <laughs> atheism. It's like the, yeah. the, the atheism Reddit community is like such a toxic hive of stupidity. It's like, oh, really? <laughs> I haven't, I've never, uh, never ventured there. What, uh, oh, <laughs> what it's, just, it like? it's, it's so much of exactly what we're talking about right now, where it's like, look at how smart and incredibly enlightened we are by like preaching our own, orthodoxy oh, God, towards cool. religious yeah. people. Yeah. And like starting fights with the religious people and calling them idiots for just like believing what they're told. And it's like, you're doing the exact same fucking thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, and to that point, he has something pretty close to that in the book where he says, uh, any belief you took in a package, for example, yeah. Democrat, Catholic, American, etc., is suspect and should be reevaluated from base principles. I think that's incredible. A great way oh, to yeah. think about it. Yeah. Yeah. The minute you put yourself in one of those buckets, you've kind of like turned off your brain. Right. And you know, what's hard is like, and it's, a, it's, I don't think it's anything about modern society. It's probably always been exactly this, this way. Uh, but it becomes really hard to talk about yourself. Right. If you aren't part of a package. Um, I don't know if you've felt that, right. Like I've, I've definitely felt that like, obviously nobody does events anymore uh, mm-hmm. at the moment, but like if you're at an event and someone's like, Oh, like, what do you do? And I'm like, what do I do? Like, <laughs> I do a lot of things. Like how much time do you have? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, right. And it's like, but I'm not, I can't neatly put myself in a package of like, Oh, I'm a developer or like, you know, I'm this right. And like, 
and I feel that way about a lot of things. Like I feel that way about politics. Like I don't neatly fit into any box on politics. I don't fit in, you know, and it's, it's frustrating from that perspective, but I don't think you can go back. Like there's no, it's like, I mean, it's kind of like, uh, I don't want to use red pill as the analogy, but it's like, you've, you've just, um, it's like irreversible, right? It's like once you're yeah. not part of one of those packages and it, I'm, I'm not trying to sound like, Oh, I'm like more woke or whatever. Right. It's not that it's just that like, I don't feel like I fit into a, a box. I don't feel like anybody really fits into a box unless they force themselves into it. Right. Like your beliefs probably don't overlap a hundred percent with a political party. Like the odds of right. that are pretty low, <laughs> but yeah. but some people act like that, right? Like that. Oh, anything like a Republican says is correct or anything a Democrat says is correct. And it's like, that's, you're probably n- not thinking for yourself. Well, and then the, the converse of that is really dangerous, right? Where I feel like the minute you suggest that like Trump has done good things, like not all of them, right? But that there is at least a single good thing Trump has done. A single good. Yeah. yeah. Like if you admit that there might even be one, you're somehow like a racist, you know, white supremacist, like Trump voting Cretan, right? And it's like, whoa, <laughs> slow down. How did we get to this point? <laughs> like, yeah. I, I just, I've had that experience more than a few times where like I'll, I'll, I'll say something good about something Trump did and it will make other people very uncomfortable, right? Yeah, there's it's some like, kind of weird. Like, I didn't vote for the guy. I don't like him. I don't want him to be president. Like I'm voting for Biden, but it's like you have to admit when people like do things that are good too. Otherwise, you're just like lying to yourself. Well, you have to if you're interested in a real discussion. Which yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> right. I was like, I don't think a lot. Like a lot of this is like. Perf- I think it's on both sides. It's not just the anti-Trump people, but it's like a lot of it's just like performance art, basically. Right. It's, it's signaling to your crowd or to your, you know, the people that you're part of your tribe. Like, you know, a lot of it is just that. Dude, uh, signaling in general as a concept is such a huge black pill where like yeah. <laughs> once you understand signaling and you just like see it everywhere and you interpret. You'll see it in things. yourself too. I mean, exactly. We all do, yeah. We all do it. Yeah. That's such a strange feeling where I, I don't know if you've had this experience, but I have it where like I'll start talking about something and then my like <laughs> reflecting self will kick in while I'm talking and be like, Hey, you're just saying this to like show how smart you are <laughs> or to show you like a line or something. And then I'll like want to stop talking mid sentence, but then I'll, f- I feel like I'll look crazy. So I kind of finish it, but then feel sort of <laughs> dirty afterwards. Like I am, do you ever do that? Like, am I crazy? I- <laughs> no, 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 you're not crazy. And I, maybe this is going to sound even worse, but um <laughs> I sometimes even think about like the podcast and, you know, blog posts or even tweets and stuff as signaling, but on purpose, like to attract yeah. the right type of person to my work oh, or to yeah. my page who I would want to know. Right. Exactly. Like, like I don't want, you know, someone who is uh, like, you know, has Trump derangement syndrome, like on my page <laughs> really. Right. So it's like a really good way to get away, get them away from you. If you like say something that would get them pissed off. Right. So it's almost like yeah. you can use signaling to attract what you want in some ways. I don't, I don't want to make that sound like the secret or something. No, but, um, I, I think it's true. Yeah. My, my friend the actually has a... the same thing, right? It's like, we talk yeah. about these ideas and these books and like someone can just look at the list of books and be like, Oh, these people read stuff that I I'm into, or they're into the same types of concepts as, as I'm into. And then I want that person to connect with us or talk to us. Like that's a, probably somebody we'll get along with. Yeah. I, I, I love that idea in general of like deliberate signaling as a filtering mechanism for who ends up around you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there, there was a funny version of this that my friend was going to do last weekend and then his fiance stopped him, but <laughs> he was doing a bunch of, he's not like a super social person, and, but he was going to a bunch of social stuff over the course of the weekend. And so he was going to wear a MAGA hat to all of it oh, just man. to see like who would get really <laughs> offended and pissed off and not want to talk to him just so he could be like, all right, cool. Like we don't need to be friends anymore. <laughs> like, the, the best thing would have been if he wore a hat that looked like a MAGA hat. Yeah. Not, yeah. Like, right? the, and, like the make they, Bitcoin great again. Yeah. Right? or they, Exactly. Like something where like if someone's not looking carefully, they wouldn't be able to tell. <laughs> but, I, I saw somebody uh, in Austin the other day who had a red hat on that said, chill. It's just a red hat. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> it's like, man, you can't even wear red hats anymore. <laughs> like, Seriously. Uh, take back red hats. Man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like how, um, I forget if, if you said this or maybe, I don't know who said this, but um, and it's not true hundred percent of the time. So this is definitely just like a 
maybe more often than not. But if somebody has like an American flag in their uh, Twitter profile, Mm -hmm. they usually lean Republican, but it's, I mean, it's the flag of the same country. Right. So it's like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's funny that like the American flag got political. Yeah. That's what I mean. It's like very strange how that's become like a signaling thing. Like to your point of you can't even wear red hats anymore. It's like, yeah, I have like two American flag tank tops that I like to wear to pools and stuff. And I feel like I get weird looks sometimes now. People yeah, like, it's very, oh, it's strange. It's Trump very supporter. strange. He likes America. Oh, fuck that guy. Like, I remember on July 4th, I'm sure I'm going to offend somebody by saying this, but I remember on like Good. July 4th uh, this year, um, I remember it was like, you, people would almost like be signaling their support or, or, uh, you know, being against Trump based on if they said like, like, ha- like happy July 4th or like being proud. Oh yeah, that was weird. I forgot about that. Or it, it, it was, yeah, it was, it was like very weird. not cool to celebrate 4th of July this year. Yeah. Like, I mean, I almost always will uh, tweet something on July 4th, like, cause I'll be doing like barbecuing or whatever. And like, I did it. And this time I know the only people that like interacted with that were not the only, but like, it definitely skewed very heavily. Uh, right. Like the people who interact with that tweet. Yeah. Uh, it was just very strange because I don't think I've even noticed that in previous years of the Trump presidency. So no, no, I feel like it was, uh, it was like this year was very unique. For, well, I guess it is an election year, but it's very un- yeah. interesting how that became a signal. Like I don't, I, I didn't think that that would become a signal, but Hey, no, anything can become signal. So. All right. In our last few minutes here, you want to do like rapid fire. Some of our other favorite quotations. Yeah. You want to just uh, take see. turns. You read one. I'll read one. Do you have one? I'm looking for uh, this. Oh, yeah. Um, it's only after you're bored that you have the great ideas. It's never going to be when you're stressed or busy, running around or rushed. Make the time. In praise of idleness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you have to free yourself up to get to that, right? No, like we're doing rapid fire. fire. Stop critiquing. <laughs> oh, we're not having any discussions. We're just going quotes, quotations. Just rapid fire. The, okay. dude, well, the, the only reason I'm suggesting that is we I, I realized that we were running out of time. And then I started scrolling and I was like, fuck, there's like at least 20 other quotes I wanted to talk <laughs> right, about. Rapid fire, rapid fire. <laughs> dude. Uh, there are no external forces affecting your emotions as much as it may feel that way. The direction you're heading in matters more than how fast you move, especially with leverage. Picking the direction you're heading in for every decision is far, far more important than how much force you apply. You'll notice when I say happiness, I mean peace. When a lot of people say happiness, they mean joy or bliss, but I'll take peace. If you have two choices to make and they're relatively equal choices, take the path more difficult and more painful in the short term. The reality is life is a single player game. You're born alone. You're going to die alone. All of your interpretations are alone. All of your memories are alone. You're gone in three generations and nobody cares. Before you showed up, nobody cared. It's all single player. Desire is a contract you make with yourself to be unhappy until you get what you want. Okay, here's one. It's not deep, but it's a good one. Buffett has a great example when he asks if you want to be the world's best lover and known as the worst or the world's worst lover and known as the best. <laughs> I like great. that. I love that. <laughs> um, how would you answer that, by the way? I know, we, I know we were doing rapid fire, but I don't know how you'd answer that. I would say, I would say, see, okay, here's the problem. I would rather be the best and known as the worst. That's, what I, that's my answer. But would you even get any at bats, right? If you're known as the worst. Yes, that's my question too. That's the problem. Right. So you get a lot of at best, a lot of at bats if you're known as the best. Right. And then you could always compensate just with other things. Everybody. Yeah. Right. It's like, <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like the message of that uh, hypothetical is that, oh, like obviously you should prefer to be great and be known as not being great, but there's so much utility in being known for being good at something. Yeah. That- I think Jay Z has a very similar line in a song that was like, would you rather be underpaid or overrated? Right. Mm, it's like, yeah, it's the same idea. It's like, okay, if you're way better than you're getting paid, then you're underrated. But if you're overpaid, that means you're getting paid more than your skill level, but that's probably a better situation to be in. Yeah. It, maybe, it's actually, maybe, it's a, maybe. it's not as easy as I think the, like, I think it's meant to be, yeah, I think it's meant to be obvious. Like, <laughs> oh, obviously you should prefer to be intrinsically great at something, but 
it's like there is significant value in like social perception of skill, right? So I guess yeah, in like the, definitely. maybe if you if you're just talking dating market, then yeah, it would be better to be like, you know, I think if we reframe it, it could be better to be although actually I mean like it's gonna sound bad. <laughs> yeah, I don't mean it to be bad, right? It's like would you rather be <laughs> an extremely honest person and known as dishonest or an extremely dishonest Mm. person and known as honest. Right. Like Hmm. it's way more advantageous to be in the second camp. Right. Yeah. It's like, what exactly do you gain from like a game theory? Yeah. From from a game theory perspective, perspective, it's like, if everybody thinks that you're dishonest, it doesn't really matter how honest you are. Right. Like you're not going to get any opportunities. So yeah, I don't know. There, there, there's social utility to reputation, right? There's a couple, um, I know we're, you know, r- wrapping up soon, but the, uh, there's a couple other episodes that we've done that I think are super relevant to this, oh, yeah. uh, this book. So yeah, finite and infinite games. Definitely. Um, one. absolutely. Uh, I think in also praise of idleness, definitely in praise of idleness. Um, crap. What's the book that was about building pyramids? That's like what I remember from it. Oh, denial of death. Uh, denial of death. Yeah. Denial of death. There's a lot of that, yeah. a lot of that talk in here. I think, um, way of Zen probably. Way of Zen. Definitely. Yeah. Um, Seneca, poor Charlie's probably. almanac. Yeah. Poor Charlie's almanac. Letters. Although, wait, no, we didn't do poor Charlie's almanac. We did. Um, we did the, like the, the article. We did one of them. We did like the article over, uh, there was like his little psychology of human misjudgments. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely in here. Um, yeah. If somebody really wants to, if you listen to this episode or read the book, uh, and you really want to go down the rabbit hole, we have like probably seven or eight episodes that tie directly into this. Yeah. Well, and, uh, sapiens is one of Naval's favorite books and we did that. Oh, that Um, was a great section of this book, by the way how he had Naval's like book recommendations in here. Yeah. Yeah. I found that really helpful because I haven't seen those aggregated in one place like that. No, I hadn't seen a collector like that either. So that was really nice. That was really helpful. Yeah. Oh, the other thing that was really cool uh, related to that is um, he reads a lot of physics, right? Or like, and math books. Yeah. He's very into math and yeah, science, which I, I had no idea. I had no idea that was the case. Yeah. yeah I like his mentioned it on tech and in, uh, interviews, but. I didn't think I it like was his like, philosophy of, you know, if you understand like math and science at a deep level, then like no book will intimidate you. Yeah. Well, right. and especially the basics, like that was really yeah. cool. Like if you understand the basics of, um, of math and science, like you don't need to know calculus, I think was his point. Right. Like right. You could, but you should know statistics stuff. and probability and cause that's like very useful in day-to-day life. Yep. Yeah. All righty. There's well, a lot in here. We didn't even get to like the whole second part. I mean, we got I some of it. Well, we, we like, we jumped around a lot. We, <laughs> yeah, we wrote we quotations from a lot of, and it's actually the nice thing about an aphoristic book kind of like this is that you can just like jump around as yeah stuff interests you, which actually fits with how Naval says he reads. Cause he reads by like jumping around in the book based on what's interesting to him. So it's actually yeah. perfectly structured for that too. Which is cool. Yeah. And it's probably a book that, well, I think I'll probably revisit um, parts over time or just randomly open up to a page uh, yeah. at some point. Right. Just cause it's like, okay, if I want a little bit of Naval wisdom, I guess you can also just go to his Twitter page, but <laughs> this, yeah. is, this is a little bit, little bit more organized than that. I can't Definitely. believe this Twitter account's free, honestly. Like that's one of the accounts. I know, it's so like, good. It's so, yeah, you're just like, okay, this is incredible value. Uh, but I think it's been good for him in terms of building like profile and stuff. I'm, I'm sure he's gotten benefits out of it. Yeah, I'm sure it's improved his payments. deal flow and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. Although I guess there's one last little paradox i guess what's that you would not expect somebody so intent on peace mental peace to be active on twitter <laughs> so active on twitter yeah and he's like active <laughs> like he he likes tweets from people who don't uh like i mean he's like like when i tweeted about this episode he liked that tweet so it's oh, not like cool. he's not seeing like you know there's some people who just never look at mentions right like i've heard right. people who get a lot of mentions they just don't even open up that page and like i can see that being a way to get mental peace, but still be active on Twitter. Like I, I can see that, but he seems to like respond and uh, like stuff. I mean, he seems to like see the tweets. And if you go to like some of the responses, there's always people arguing because that's what Twitter is. Uh, and he, uh, he's still active on Twitter. So uh, yeah. either he, maybe he uses it as like an exercise to see if he can maintain his peace despite that. exercise of being exposed to chaos that will make him miserable. Yeah, like the equivalent of a cold shower, right? To like, yeah, <laughs> that he talks about. 
uh, yeah, I don't know. That was just an interesting, cause a lot of this book does focus on like mental peace and, and maintaining your balance and stuff. And, um, Twitter is not so conducive to that. No. <laughs> to say that. <laughs> All right. Well, if you haven't picked it up yet, definitely grab a copy of the Almanac of Naval Ravikant when you get a chance. Say hi to uh, Eric Jorgensen on Twitter, where he's very active, and say hi to Naval on Twitter. Let them know that you enjoyed this episode. I'm sure they'd appreciate to hear that. Uh, you can hit up Neil and I as well. I'm at Nat Eliasson. I'm at the real Neil S. And if you and, like the if you like the episode or you're enjoying the, these episodes, obviously uh, tell your friends. That's how most people hear about it. Um, that or maybe like the podcast search, but I think so messy, yeah. a lot of it's word. Yeah. I think a lot of it we'll is, see. is word yeah. of mouth and uh, leave a review. If you, if you haven't already done so. Yeah. Reviews are super helpful. Definitely appreciate it. Uh, and we will be back in a few weeks. Do we know what book we're doing next. I don't think we, we have no idea. <laughs> All right. I, I don't either. So you better follow us on Twitter to find out what book is next. Cause yeah, that's, that's how we've been doing it. it. I think yeah. people have been liking that. Like I've, I've had some people reading along with us. So yeah, that's great. So, yeah. Definitely hit us up on Twitter. Oh, and let us know if you if you like the swag idea. Maybe we can like do something something fun. There's like a few thousand subscribers here, right? Like it's it's a big enough list of uh, loving listeners that we could do like a very small swag run. So we only need ten of you to tweet at us and tell yeah. us. I mean, that's yeah. If oh, you the, like the, the ten idea. the ten who do will get a discount. To Ooh, the okay. Idea. There we go. <laughs> Using some uh, some some influence. Uh, tricks it's there. The, it's the Rome course playbook. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. He'll close this after 10 orders. Oh, we already got the first one. <laughs> it doesn't work when the episode hasn't been released yet. <laughs> yeah. There's only nine left. Go, go, go. <laughs> yeah, it somehow is that regardless of when you hear the episode, if you hear the episode five years from now, it's still... <laughs> yeah, there's still there's still so only you, two left. You better yep. send us that tweet. <laughs> Oh man, I think there's a, I think Ryan, uh, Ryan Culp d- does the honest marketing thing. And I remember mm-hmm. seeing, uh, there was one that he posted like maybe a year ago or something. And it was somebody who, some website that had like hard coded that in there, right? It looked like, oh, a, yeah, or, yeah. like how many were left. And, and it the was div just, was even called like the, the div that it was in was called something like, uh, like false urgency it had some yeah, hilarious yeah, name that. exactly <laughs> yeah yeah exactly <laughs> it's like man yeah that's so our, that's just our way of saying like beware if you see those things online most of them are not legit yeah whenever you see a webinar starting in 15 minutes it's pre-recorded <laughs> and it's a trick to get your email address yeah <laughs> join now or it's join gone now. forever all right I will talk to you soon, sir. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And uh, we'll let you know the next book on Twitter. See you guys next time. Bye.